Nice scuba suit. You need a ride, darling? How about a smile for me, huh? How about a handshake? <laughs> Here's a proposition for you. You're gonna give me your jacket, your helmet, and your motorcycle, and in return, I'm gonna let you keep your hand. Take it. Very stunning, very brave, really a person you can look up to. I mean, the guy had it coming because he was rude and asked her to smile. Wow. That's not good. Wow. Of course she had to steal his bike and his clothes, and then rob this innocent store's mannequin for the rest of her outfit. They deserved it. Uh, when feminists watch movies like this, do they not notice this stuff? Look at this article titled, Six Reasons Why We Love Captain Marvel. Carol's power isn't about feeling superior? She literally goes on a power trip and robs a guy because he was slightly rude. And that's not the only time she displays her power arrogantly. Okay, your turn. Prove you're not a scroll. <laughs> Is this what makes a hero now? She just destroyed that restaurant owner's property unprovoked. I understand that she was trying to prove to Nick Fury that she's not the enemy, but there are many other ways she could have done that. Oh wait, the restaurant owner is a man, so I guess it's okay. I feel like maybe I watched a different movie than all the feminists were watching. Certainly the first scene I used was changed for the final cut, but even in that version, she still robs a guy for the same reason. Really though, I think that Brie Larson was perfectly cast for this role because her actual personality is just about as unlikable as the character she plays in Captain Marvel. But Captain Marvel is not the only movie like that. There are many other feminist hero movies out there that are just as bad. There's another one I want to talk about because when it came out, everyone was saying it was a good movie, but when I watched it, it was so terrible that I almost walked out of the theater. We'll get into it, but first, if you like the content you see on this channel, then consider making a donation. Viewer support helps keep me independent and it helps fund a lot of the quality improvements that I make on this channel. Links to my PayPal, Patreon, and Subscribestar pages can all be found in the description. And also, don't forget to support me on Alt Tech. Links to my BitChute channel, my Minds page, and my Parlor page can be found in the description as well. All right, let's talk about another awful feminist movie with a female hero, which is the first Wonder Woman movie. This was the movie that made all the feminist dreams come true. Finally, we get a female lead in a superhero movie. Never before has there been a positive female hero for girls to look up to. It's just like what Anita Sarkeesian said about video games, but with television and movies. Hero stories are a man's world, and now it's our turn. Yeah, cool story. Let's just forget about Sarah Connor, Ripley, Mulan, Hermione, Uma Thurman, or if you want to talk about TV, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I understand that some of these characters don't have magical powers, but you don't have to have magical superpowers to be a positive role model. This is the same age-old bad argument that woke groups always use. They even tried to pull this crap with Black Panther, which I actually liked, but they said, Finally a black hero! Uh, what about Blade? Blade was about a black hero, and it was Marvel's first superhero movie success after a ton of failure. Blade was a pivotal movie when it comes to superhero films, and if it wasn't a hit, the Marvel Cinematic Universe may not even be a thing. Also, I guess they forgot about Static Shock or Falcon or Miles Morales. But I digress. How about we instead talk about how stunning and brave Wonder Woman is? A movie that is so feminist, they forgot to make Wonder Woman the leader, or even the hero of her own story. Here is the real leader and hero of the Wonder Woman movie. The way this war is going, I wouldn't want to let anyone I care about near it. Then why do you want to go back? I don't think want is the word. I guess I gotta try. My father told me once, he said, if you see something wrong happening in the world, you can either do nothing or you can do something. And I already tried nothing. That's right. Actor Chris Pine, or his character Steve Trevor, is the actual hero in this movie. Diana, or Wonder Woman, is not the hero. I laughed a little inside my head when I noticed that in the theater. 
In fact, this movie almost has Indiana Jones syndrome where you could remove Wonder Woman from the movie and it would still have the same ending. I think the only thing of consequence that Diana does is save Steve's life at the beginning. The rest of the movie is just Steve babysitting her and trying to prevent her from getting everyone killed. More on that later. Also, before you get more into it, yes, I'm going to spoil the entire movie. If that's something you care about, watch it first and then come back. That being said, let's talk about why Wonder Woman is not the hero. There are two central parts to the philosophy of a hero movie. The first part is called the lie the hero believes. We'll get into that later. The second part is the hero's primary motivation for helping people. We already heard Steve's motivation, so let's hear Diana's. So much you do not understand. I understand enough. But I'm willing to fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. So herein lies my main problem with feminism. They love to say a bunch of things that sound really good, but are actually really terrible when people carry them out. When feminists say, I'm here to speak for the people who don't have a voice, they aren't preaching a philosophy that helps people. What they are actually saying is that they are here to create a bunch of dependents. That's not a hero. A hero isn't there to solve everyone's problems because they are too weak. A hero does great things and inspires people to become strong and do things for themselves. The idea of a hero is to create more heroes, not a bunch of people who wait to be saved. For example, I know a lot of people didn't like this movie, but I think this scene from The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is relevant to my point. Spider-Man is late to save the day because bad things happened earlier in the movie, so someone stands up to take his place. This is what a hero does. Heroes inspire the weak to become strong. They don't simply solve people's problems for them. Spider-Man inspires that kid to fight for himself instead of creating a situation where that kid is just waiting to be saved. Of course, that kid's not going to win and this was a failed teaser for a third movie, but you get the point. What the kid did was very brave and it's important from a philosophical standpoint because a lot of times brave people stand up against impossible challenges and still achieve victory. Heroes don't strive to make people dependent on them. That's what villains do. Villains love making people dependent on them because then if a person refuses to do what the villain wants, they can threaten to remove their support which will leave the person destitute. And yes, real villains will hide that they are doing this under the disguise of being altruistic. Okay, back to Wonder Woman. Most of this movie, she is being led around by Chris Pine's character. Now you might say, well, that's because she's in a foreign land. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, she's not the leader. Plus, just because she's unfamiliar with the subject matter doesn't mean she can't lead. The whole point of leading a team is to recruit and organize people of different knowledge sets in order to solve a problem. You are supposed to find people who know things that you don't. Diana not knowing anything about World War I or the landscape shouldn't stop her from leading. There are plenty of things that she could have given her expert opinion on, like the main villain, Ares. However, she fails to communicate the importance of Ares to her team right up until he reveals himself at the end of the movie. But like a lot of these lame feminist movies, The entirety of Wonder Woman's value comes from what she was born with and not things she's earned. This next scene, I think, is an excellent example of that. Personally, I believe it's the worst scene in the entire movie. Let me give you some background in case you haven't seen Wonder Woman. Steve Trevor is a spy who steals a notebook that contains a formula for a new gas bomb created by a woman who goes by Dr. Poison. Dr. Poison is a villain who, of course, cannot do evil of her own accord. She is only evil because she is being controlled by a man, whose name is Ludendorff. Yet again, feminists denying that women can be responsible for horrific acts unless there's a man to blame. Anyway, Steve flies away and crashes on the magical island of the Amazons, or Themyscira. Then, the Germans attack the island, and Diana's mentor, Claire from House of Cards, dies. After this, Steve and Diana team up to go find Ares, who Diana insists is responsible for World War I. 
they go to London and find a ragtag group of men to fight the Germans and stop the new poison gas from being used on the public. On their way there, they end up in a trench next to some town that the Germans have taken over. Diana sees the horrors of war and wants to recklessly fight the Germans to save the town. In response, Steve, as the voice of reason, says this. Diana, we have to go. We need to help these people. We have to stay on mission. <laughs> we Fuck. cannot leave without helping them. These people are dying. This is no man's land, Diana. All right, because on the other side, there are a bunch of Germans pointing machine guns at every square inch of this place. This is not something you can cross. It's not possible. So what? So we do nothing? No, we, do, we are doing something. We are. We just, we can't save everyone in this war. Steve, Steve. This is not what we came here to do. So naturally, Diana defies the wishes of her leader and jumps into combat without notifying any of her team or developing any sort of plan. Real smart. No, but it's what I'm going to do. Diana! After she stops a bunch of bullets, her friends run into the line of fire to help her. This is quite possibly one of the dumbest things I've seen in a hero movie, and it only works because Wonder Woman is a god. One of the ways you inspire people to do incredible things is to show intelligent solutions to problems and to show bravery. Well, certainly running into a bunch of bullets because you are way stronger than your opponents is something any idiot could have thought of, and it's not very brave to go into a combat situation where no one can harm you. Just like it's not very brave for feminists to repeat mainstream talking points and then call themselves brave. Wonder Woman doesn't even look like she's trying. That's really the major problem of this movie. At no point do I ever feel like anyone can actually hurt Diana. Real brave when you only fight opponents who are much weaker than you. Also, Diana completely disregards her team members. Just another example of how she would be a terrible leader if she was actually the leader. She may be immune to bullets, but her team members aren't. Because she initiates combat, her team goes in to assist her, and any one of them could have been killed or severely injured, which would have ruined the mission and led to millions of people dying because they failed to stop Dr. Poison. Remember how I said this movie would have been better off without Wonder Woman? The whole point of this scene philosophically is to show how terrible war is. How much more impact on the audience would this scene have had if you didn't have a god who could just snap her fingers and make everything okay? Imagine a better version of this movie that excludes Diana. Instead, the heroes come into this scene and see how awful trench warfare is while realizing there is nothing they can do about it. They see the harsh reality of war, which is that a lot of times you are hoisted into a situation where everybody loses. That motivates them even further to push through the struggles of their mission so they can stop Dr. Poison. Wouldn't that be a much better deterrent from idealizing war and also a better encouragement for people to get along, rather than Wonder Woman just giving her side everything they want? So after that scene, because everything worked out the last time Diana was reckless, she decides to be reckless again. The team infiltrates a German party with Dr. Poison and Ludendorff. Diana is told to stay behind, but she disobeys the leader again and goes into the party anyway. This screws Steve up when he is about to find out from Dr. Poison where her lab is. Diana also almost blows their cover and gets Steve killed when she gets emotional and tries to attack Ludendorff. Only one of the many gods believed in that. Hmm. And he was wrong. You know nothing of the gods. Enjoy the fireworks. What are you doing? Out of my mind. Diana, look at me. If you kill Ludendorff before we find the gas, we won't be able to stop anything. I will stop Ares. What if you're wrong? She was wrong. An attack was already scheduled, so if she had killed that guy in that scene, she would have blown their cover and tons of people would have died because they wouldn't know where to find the poison. Also, Diana, yet again, shows a complete lack of concern for her boyfriend. She's a god. 
If people shoot at her, she'll be fine. But remember, they are behind enemy lines, they are surrounded, and I would imagine that no one at that party is on their side. If Steve didn't stop her, he would have died. Again, Wonder Woman is supposed to be the hero, right? Let's get to the second part of a hero story's philosophy, which is the lie that the hero believes. In order for a hero story to be interesting, the hero has to learn something which means they have to believe some sort of falsehood that leads to a major problem they are having. Usually this problem should reflect an important fault that real people have. Here is the lie that Diana believes. Ares poisoned men's hearts with jealousy and suspicion. He turned them against one another. And war ravaged the earth. Zeus created men to be just and wise, strong and passionate. That was a story, Diana. There's much you do not understand. Men are easily corrupted. Men are easily corrupted? And women aren't? Even though she resists this a little in that last scene, Diana still believes the propaganda of her culture, which is that all men are evil. Speaking of the double standards of cancel culture, how is this allowed? Because I'm offended by these words, and it's my understanding that if anything is offensive, we aren't allowed to talk about it. Even if we are saying it's wrong. I mean, the Papa John's guy lost his entire business for saying the full N-word in a statement where he talked about how he didn't like the N-word. If you were to change the words around in this scene from men to women, these lines would have been a cancelable offense. Now, in my humble beliefs, if you need to vent and say negative things about men, go ahead. That's fine. Sometimes men do negative things. But don't then say absolutely nothing negative can be said about women. Otherwise, you are just a hypocrite with an agenda. Also, here's something I found funny. Did anyone else notice that the Amazon's technological progression stopped when they separated from men? In this movie, the men have guns and airplanes, while the women are still using swords and shields from over a thousand years ago. Outside of the double standard of cancel culture, here's why this philosophy was a bad choice. Diana believes that all men are evil, but has never actually been hurt by that belief. There is not one situation in this movie where that belief leads her to any problems. That's because in a feminist movie, women are perfect and nothing can ever be wrong with them. It's the same thing in Captain Marvel. Here is the lie that she believes. There's nothing more dangerous to a warrior than emotion. You struggle with your emotions. You're a DC fighter, but you're too emotional. Do not let your emotions override your judgment. But can you keep your emotions in check long enough to take me on? Or will they get the better of you as always? Wait, sorry. That last one was a spoiler, but who cares? The movie sucked. So not only do they repeat this idea like 4,000 times during the movie, but Carol Danvers is never actually harmed by being overly emotional. She doesn't get angry like the Hulk and blow up a city or anything. They just say she has that fault without ever showing it. Terrible writing. You are supposed to show your audience, not tell them. It really seemed like they just wanted to shame people for saying women are too emotional. Here's an idea. How about instead, you talk about how narcissistic Carol is? That's a real problem the character has, and it's a tragic flaw that feminists have. If that was the moral of the story, you might have actually taught feminists something useful. Back to Wonder Woman. Let's skip to the climax. Now the team has found out where Dr. Poison is planning to release her gas bomb, and they have cornered the evil man, Ludendorff, who is the real villain controlling her. Diana thinks that Ludendorff is Ares, so she sticks a sword through him. Plot twist, he wasn't Ares, it was actually Steve's boss. While Diana is fighting the real Ares, Dr. Poison plans to arm a plane with gas that will kill everyone within a 50 mile radius. It is here where we see the actual hero, Steve Trevor, save the day by blowing up the plane and sacrificing his life. That was true heroism. Steve goes up against a worthy challenge and sacrifices his life to save tons of people. This is actually brave because he isn't invulnerable and he has something to lose. So back to how I said that Wonder Woman is essentially useless in this movie. Well, it turns out that Ares' master plan was to get humans to destroy themselves. Ares is supposed to be that chaotic force who whispers into your ear and tells you to be violent. 
Because Steve saved the day, Ares has no one to manipulate and therefore would have to go back into hiding for a while. As I said, the only useful thing Diana does in this movie is save Steve after his plane crashes. Oh, and here is the best part. After all of the men that Diana kills during this movie, she decides to take mercy on Dr. Poison, who is just about to go kill thousands of people. Look at her and tell me I'm wrong. She is the perfect example of these humans. Destroy her, Diana. You know that she deserves it. You're wrong about them. Doesn't Dr. Poison look so helpless? You couldn't possibly hurt her. Weird because like five seconds ago, Diana went into a fit of rage and killed like 10 men. She also killed a ton of men on the way to the base. Most people on both sides of World War I didn't really want to fight. Those men were probably just doing their job, whereas Dr. Poison was one of the criminal masterminds trying to prolong the war. Now you might say, well, there were German people standing up after she defeats Ares, so those guys didn't actually die. Really? This chick is a god who is strong enough to lift a tank over her head. She was in full rage mode when she attacked those guys, and she was not holding back. They would have all died. Also, she stuck a sword through Ludendorff. What makes him so different? Technically, his body count is lower than hers. From my memory, he only kills one guy. However, Dr. Poison kills a whole room of her political enemies while he just kind of holds the door shut. It is over for all of you. They don't know that. <laughs> and then she laughs at the thought of them being tortured. She also does human testing and kills people while she is developing her gas formula. This woman is pure evil. Why would you spare her? What happened to equality? Do feminists only care about equality when it's something that benefits them? After Dr. Poison is spared, the movie gets really stale. Wonder Woman blurts out the lesson of the movie and then proceeds to shoot a powerful energy beam to defeat Ares, which is very anime, and not in a good way. That is one of the most overused anime tropes in existence. Let's watch. They're everything you say, but so much more. Rise! They do not deserve your protection! It's not about deserve. Goodbye, brother. Diana didn't have any real challenge to overcome. She just proclaims, I'm stronger than you, therefore I win. Which is actually the same exact way that Captain Marvel ended. How did these movies make so much money again? Captain Marvel had the coattails of the Avengers to ride on, but I'm not really sure why Wonder Woman did so well. Though, Batman vs. Superman was arguably worse and incredibly boring, yet that movie still pulled in $870 million. So maybe I'm the one who's wrong about what makes a popular movie. Okay, I've shown you a bunch of bad examples of female heroes, so how about I end off with a good one? I'm not going to talk about this movie too much because it just came out, so I'm only going to talk about plot points that aren't super spoiler heavy. The movie is called Run, Hide, Fight. It takes a good 20 minutes to start, but it's a far better movie than Captain Marvel and Wonder Woman. If you don't believe me, look at the Rotten Tomatoes scores. Super low ratings from the paid off critics, followed by an amazing audience score. Then when you read the critics' reviews, they spend more time hashing out their political disagreements than actually commenting on the content of the movie. That's not suspicious at all. So this movie follows a high schooler named Zoe Hall, who maneuvers her way through a school shooting as she tries to save as many lives as possible. One of the very noticeable differences between this movie and the feminist movies I talked about before is that Zoe actually has problems. Zoe is not an all-powerful Mary Sue who only fights opponents who are way weaker than her. In fact, I believe that every one of Zoe's opponents in this movie is stronger than her, so when she fights back, it's actually brave. 
Like I said, I'm not going to spoil any major plot points, I'm just going to show Zoe's character. I highly recommend you go watch this movie at the Daily Wire. In this first scene, Zoe avoids the attention of the shooters after almost getting caught and makes it out of the school. At this point, she is free to run away and save herself, but she instead decides to sacrifice herself and go and save as many lives as possible. Chris Jellick have guns in the cafeteria. Yeah, well, okay, they are mean. killing people. Don't go back inside unless you want to die, okay? You're not coming? No, most of them still don't know. Okay, I'm with you. Instead of jumping into the center of a firefight like an idiot like Wonder Woman did, Zoe uses tactics and her intelligence to achieve her goals. Speaking of one of my big movie pet peeves, this is going to sound a little messed up, but Zoe is the only hero I can think of off the top of my head who actually takes time to loot corpses for useful resources. I'm so glad they included that in the movie because it seems like almost always, heroes walk right over items such as free weapons or other resources they could have used to take down their enemies. Moving on to the next scene without spoiling too much, here is one of Zoe's successes. After she goes back into the school, she saves a classroom of students and inspires a teacher who previously was content on hiding to go help and save more people. All clear, all clear. Okay, please, but just around this corner, go as fast as you can. Go! Nice! You're coming, aren't you? No, everyone's still in lockdown. I'm gonna try to warn as many as I can, okay? So just... Not alone, you're not. Mr. Croft, go! Everyone, run! So you can see where they are. Come on, go! You're obviously very smart. Come on! That is a hero. She saved people and inspired others who were weaker to stand up and fight rather than merely saying that she was going to solve their problems for them because they were too weak to do so. And on that topic of solving your own problems, I spent a lot of time talking about how to build yourself up individually, but I don't spend a lot of time talking about the secondary aspect of that, which is building up your team or your network. Certainly, you should be spending time conquering your own problems and becoming the hero of your own story, but you should also be building a team of people around you who will all fight for each other so you can insulate yourselves from harm. There are a lot of problems out there that are too complicated to handle on your own, particularly if you are being attacked. The harsh reality of the world is that there is always going to be some threat of someone attacking you, and most of the time, those people come in groups. Authoritarianism is a very common topic of discussion on this channel, and one of the most effective tactics they use is to destroy your network or your ability to build a team of people to stand up against them. This is why in places like North Korea, they forced people to sell out their own families, or in Soviet Russia, they had secret police, and like 30% of people were secret police. It's so nobody can trust each other enough to work together. So not only do they propagandize you into believing a ton of philosophies that will turn you into a loser who can't achieve anything, but they will also pit you against the people who can help you. This is why the destruction of the family is so crucial to authoritarianism. The woke social justice warriors can try to get you fired from your job, but if you have an uncle who owns his own company and he has a job for you, then their tactics don't work. Which means, of course, when you look at the websites of radical groups like BLM, you'll see that one of their core philosophies is to destroy the nuclear family. Oh wait, they had to remove that because it pissed a bunch of people off because those people realized that broken families are one of the most detrimental things to society. But don't let that fool you. Destruction of the family is still one of BLM's goals. So when you are networking, the first network you work on is your own family. Now I understand that the establishment has done a lot to make people hate their own families, and you might not be able to bring everyone back together. However, you can still do the best you can to try and get along with and unite as many of your family members as possible. Outside of that, you don't just build your family unit. You also have to build your network with your friends and your profession. Look at it this way. You don't think the establishment elites are doing this? Let's look back to two months ago. Parler was on the rise and it was about to put Twitter out of business because Twitter participated in some major scandals in the 2020 election. Just as Parler was exploding and becoming the top app, Apple, Google, and Amazon banded together to kill Parler as it was about to overtake Twitter. Apple and Google removed Parler from their app stores 
and Amazon violated its contract with Parler to shut down its server access. And then the entire media establishment joined in to attack Parler. You don't think the establishment has networks? They have networks, and they are extremely effective. Do the same thing. How do you build a network? The best way to do this is to hand out as many favors as you can and to help as many people as you can. You're going to have to be a little proactive in this and you will most likely be helping a lot more people than you get help back from. That's perfectly fine. Contrary to the constant virtue signaling of the radical left, it's okay to be charitable and get nothing back or get no clout for it. If you help 10 people, then when you are in need, three of those people might want to return the favor. If you continue to trade favors, then you now have a network of friends. That's what you do when you're trying to build good friends. Friends don't just hang out, they help each other. When you build a professional network, you'll want to help people as you display some sort of skill that you have that's useful. The way I do this is by primarily teaching people how to build a social media following. I can do this with individuals by helping them build their YouTube channels, and I can essentially do the same thing with companies. This way, I have a group of powerful friends who can all protect each other if one of us ever gets in trouble. If you have been looking at current YouTube events, you might have seen that recently some activists tried to cancel Jeremy from the quartering. All of Jeremy's network banded together and they defeated the activist. They even got YouTube to send a personal message to that activist saying that Jeremy had broken no rules. That's a victory, and without his network, Jeremy probably would have lost to the activist. And yes, the activist also had a network. That's why cancel culture is so effective. All of them gang up on one person. As for me, even if the worst happens and I lose my channel, I can just handle the social media of some company that I've helped. I have 10 different lines of defense, and these cancel culture activists can't ruin my life by only removing one of them. That's what you need. You want as many lines of defense as possible. If you get your life in order, build useful skills, pay off your debt, build wealth, and build good friend, family, and professional networks, then none of these people and their crappy philosophies will ever be able to touch you. But with that said, I think that's enough for this video. So if you liked it, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new, comment and share. If you would like to support this channel, then you can do so with PayPal, Patreon, or Subscribestar, you can find all of those links in the description. Last, if you haven't checked me out on BitChute, Mines, or Parlor, you can also find those links in the description. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.